Только то, что сказали. Thanks a lot. So here's again the title of my talk, and I'd like to acknowledge my main collaborators for this research. This is Jonas Peters from Copenhagen, Nikolai Meinthausen, my colleague, and uh, Dominic Rotenhäusler, who is now here in Berkeley. In fact, he was a key contributor of what I will present today. So if you look at this title, you might ask, well, what do these things have to do with each other? And I start with causality and robustness. And we have been working on the former rather exotic problem for quite a while, but it turns out that there are interesting connections to robustness. And this is what I want to explain a bit here today. <coughs> so here is a nutshell view of robust optimization, distributionally robust optimization. So you have a loss function, you have data, uh, random variables. These are x and y, x are covariates, y are response variables. I have an unknown parameter beta. I look at a risk. P is kind of a distribution, the data generating distribution maybe. And I look at worst case risk over a class and try to find the parameter which optimizes the worst case risk. So typically the class of distributions is within the Wasserstein distance ball. Uh, with radius rho around P0, around the reference, and P0 might be the empirical distribution. So this has good performance under adversarial distributions. And in my view, one important point here is that it is also good under adversarial test distributions. So what it happened in the test sample might be quite different than what you've seen in the data. This is quite a bit different from maybe the more classical robust statistics point of view. So this is Huber's celebrated minimax result. So you can look at robust statistics from a uh, worst case risk optimization point of view. So it looks exactly kind of similar. So you have a risk, an L2 risk. You look at worst case risk and you find, you try to find the best estimator. In fact, uh, in a certain class, this is the Huber estimator with a different loss function. So the class is typically a neighborhood of a Gaussian reference distribution, P0. We've heard about this a bit yesterday. And a bit philosophically, a main difference in my view is that this is particularly geared for good performance under contaminated training sample distribution. Maybe also in the test sample, but already the training sample is contaminated. Okay. So here is maybe a more general robustness viewpoint. And what we aim to do is to achieve stability, or we call it an also near invariance, as you'll see later, for a class of meaningful or interesting distributions. And this class is not necessarily a neighborhood. It's not necessarily, say, a, a ball with a Wasserstein <coughs> metric or anything like that. But we try to capture our interesting directions for which we want to achieve stability or robustness. Well, this is a bit like in classical statistical robustness. It's also like in robust optimization. But perhaps surprisingly also causality can be looked at from this viewpoint. You want to look at a class of distributions where you are stable. OK, so now I say quite a few things on causality and then coming back to robustness, but that's kind of my motivation that the things are actually closely connected with each other. Well, causality, a word causal is super ambitious. It is perhaps too ambitious for many practical problems. But our point is, in a way, even if it is too ambitious, at least in some applications, we want to do something which is perhaps more suitable than things which you, than a technique which is based on a standard regression or classification framework. Even if we cannot find the causes, and maybe this is you know, what life is, it's very, very hard to find the causes. Maybe we can do something better than just standard regression or classification. So the gold standard in causality would be a randomized control experiment. That's great to do. This is very difficult, very costly, can be unethical, and so on and so forth. And very modern applications do not have access to randomized control trial data. And so my question is, what can we say if we do not have access to data from a randomized control trial? And my point will be, and I try to phrase it more as a worst case optimization problem, we look at this from a prediction point of view. Now, causality is actually some sort of a predictive question. The question in causality, in a loose sense, actually could be formulated as, it is a what if I do question. 
or a question, what would happen if I perturb? That's kind of the central question in causality. And so the point here is I try to do a prediction scheme for the outcome of an unobserved manipulation, of an unobserved perturbation, of an unobserved intervention. Okay. So many modern applications are faced with these kind of questions. So in genomics, this is where I'm personally a bit involved in. The question could read as follows. What would be the effect if you manipulate a certain gene in a plant? This is a picture of the Arabidopsis plant. And I'm interested in the effect on the growth rate of the plant. Okay. So you would like to know what would happen if you manipulate gene 7, but you do not have data from this perturbation on gene 7. Okay. So the point is you want to predict this manipulation, but you have no data on that perturbation. Or in e-commerce, it would be the question, what would be the effect of showing a person X, Y, Z, an advertisement on social media, but you have no data on such an advertisement campaign of such an intervention for person X, Y, Z, or person being similar in X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth. So modern applications are full with these kind of questions. And so here's a very simple slide, but I think it's instructive and it's kind of interesting to look at. Suppose you have two variables, x and y. y is my outcome. I have x, a covariate. This is actually synthetic data, just to warm up a bit. And of course, you see this data. You say, OK, I can fit a straight line. This is great. This is easy to do. In a regression course, we would say it fits quite well. And now the question is, OK, now I manipulate on x. I make a perturbation on x. This is what I have observed in the data. I manipulate, and I say I put the value of the covariate x to, say, minus 8. And the question is, what would be the best prediction for y? If you believe in regression technology, your prediction is here on the line. That would be the best prediction. And that, of course, corresponds to somehow the idea x causes y. So if you manipulate x, it will change y. And the way it changes, you can learn it from the data. It changes according to the regression strength. But of course, it could also be a good prediction to say the mean of y is my best prediction. Because if the underlying truth would be that y would cause x, you manipulate x, nothing happens to y. And the best prediction is the mean. Okay. This is a very simple problem, but actually a very hard problem to solve in practice. So actually what you now, what we want to do is to say, okay, please decide, make the correct prediction whether it's here or there. Well, how'd you write your simulation code? Excuse me? How did you write your simulation code? <laughs> <laughs> the simulation was uh, <laughs> x causes y, let's say. No, I took a bivariate Gaussian, fitted the best straight line. You can do whatever you want to do. <laughs> OK, I don't know the truth. <laughs> but this is actually not only synthetic, this is real. So here's an exposure to a real application in genomics. It's exactly this problem. And actually, it looks very much like the synthetic data, a bit at least. So here are gene expressions. Here is an X gene, here's a Y gene. You measure thousands of genes. And what you observe are the, uh, the data points in the blue cloud. So this is what you observe. And you can fit a regression line. Well, it's hard to see, but there's a regression strength. There's a correlation between these genes which you observe. Then you actually do the experiment in the lab. This has been done. You manipulate the X gene. It actually had a huge effect. So you kind of turn off the activity of the X gene. And lo and behold, the prediction, uh, what came out in the experiment on the Y gene was down there, which fits quite well to this straight line here. And here is another two pair of genes. So here's an X gene, a Y gene. You see the observed data. You see a correlation. There's a regression strength. You manipulate in the lab. You knock out the X gene. Uh, there is a change. So you really have no expression of the X gene anymore. Nothing happens with the Y gene. Okay. It's exactly as before. And the challenge is the same. How the heck can you make the prediction whether it should be down there or here? So how do we do this? So this is, in a nutshell, again, the problem. And of course, if you only would have these two variables in the game, it's hopeless unless you make very, very strong assumptions on your bivariate distribution. The point is you have more than two, these two variables. 
And the idea may be a bit as usual in statistics, you try to borrow strengths, right? But the borrow strengths is not like some sort of a smoothing or something like that. The borrow <coughs> strengths is you try to borrow strengths from other perturbations. Okay? So I have some sort of knocked out other genes, and from these other gene knockouts, I can try to learn that. But I want to point out very clearly, if you just know the probability distribution of the system in the steady state, if you just have the observational distribution, you cannot solve this problem. And that means, in a way, if you have the best regression or classification technology, if you have a super good deep neural net, you cannot solve this problem. The problem is about directionality, and a deep neural net doesn't give you an answer on directionality. So, as I said, we want to borrow strength from other perturbations. So, and I assume now I do have other perturbations, or maybe much more unspecific, I do have heterogeneity in my data set. So it's, I kind of have outliers, but the outliers are actually very informative. I have them in the data set. <clears throat> of course, many people have worked on causal inference. Uh, there is a potential outcome model. Neyman was here at Berkeley, made very, very fundamental and early contribution in his master's thesis before he came to Berkeley. There are graphical and structural equation models, Perl, many others. Many people have worked on this. We propose something rather different. Yeah. So this heterogeneity, is it basically going to give you the overlaps, which you would get in uh, the ideal randomized trial? Is that kind of the direction you think you are? So there are, as you will see, there will be many, so I need to make models on the heterogeneity. And there can be fairly different ways of uh, models and heterogeneity. So in my gene example, with the overlap, I don't need, I can really, I, I have. Oh, you can't put without overlap, right? I mean, it's like a matching problem. If you, can't, if you can't match the counterfactuals, what can you say? You don't, you, you don't see it exactly. So under additional assumptions, you can try to just predict the counterfactual. So this is what you try to do. Maybe we should uh, put that a bit offline. Okay. But of course, the art is here to predict the counterfactual. And if I have predicted this quite well, I can, for example, measure sure. And the question is, how do we, mo we need a model? And I'll develop some models here. And that is kind of, in a way, the art of the game. Maybe a bit differently to what people have been doing before also is that the perturbations, the heterogeneities can be rather unspecific. But the more specific we make them, the more we can say about it, the more we understand what's happening. But even if they're rather unspecific, we can still do something. OK, so let's go a bit into that. So I tried to formalize this a bit. So let's just think we have heterogeneous data. I don't quite know what the heterogeneities are, how they arise, but I observe them. I have known subpopulations in the data or experimental conditions or environments. So maybe people in sciences do experiments under different environmental conditions. And, and so I know this is environment one, environment two. I know these environments. I'm thinking of a regression or classification type problem. I have covariates. I have response. They have a distribution. And all this depends on the environment, on the subpopulation in your data. So this little e is the index for the environment. And this is an important uh, notation. They are from this script e. And script D is the space of observed environments which I have in my data set. So let's make it very simple. So the first little simple example is I have data from 10 different countries. I have 10 different subpopulations. And so this script D, this is the space of observed subpopulations. It could be labeled by 1, 2, up to 10. Okay. So it could also be, say, in an economic type context, you have data from different economical scenarios over time. And maybe your environments or your heterogeneity has been generated over time. And so your little e typically would be constructed as blocks of consecutive time points. Okay. The script e has been observed in the data. Now I'm asking, OK, now let's look at a space script f which is much larger than script E. So script F contains the perturbations, the environments, the subpopulations, which I have not observed in the data. Okay. 
And so the example from before, script dev could be the 10 countries which I have in the data, maybe all other countries in the world which I have not seen. Or in the economical prediction scenario, the script dev could be the script D are the environments, the time regimes I've seen until today, and script dev are many, many possible perturbations, environments which might happen in the future. Okay, you don't see them. And so here is the prediction problem. It's very pragmatic. I try to predict y given x as usual, such that the prediction works well or is robust for all these many possible environments E in this much larger space script F based on data from script E from much fewer environments. Yep. So, so in, in, in the terminology of kind of standard machine learning, what you're doing is from a problem of domain adaptation, mm -hmm. you're going to the problem of transfer learning. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, is, it is a form of transfer learning. <coughs> But it's a, it's, the call, it's a causal form of transfer learning. And, and you'll see our models, but it is a way how to model the transfer. Yeah. Now here again is the prediction problem. I repeat, I predict y given x such that the prediction works well, is robust for all these many scenarios in this script f, which I have not seen in the data. OK, let's mathematize this a bit. And let's look at a linear model. And I look at the L2 risk. And I look at the worst case L2 risk, the maximum <laughs> over all these scenarios in this future script F, and try to minimize that, try to optimize that. OK, you would say this is robustness, right? If you look at this problem, I would also say this is some sort of a robustness problem. And now, loosely speaking, and I'll define it a bit more, causality is predicting an answer to a what would happen to a what if I perturb question. It is a prediction for a new unseen scenario. And so this is not only robustness. I mean, loosely speaking, this also has something to do about causality. Because causality is kind of a framework where you really try to predict what would happen on an unknown scenario. In fact, this is a result which you can make rigorous. And I'll come a bit more to that, but as a pre-announcement, you can look at a certain space script F. Now I'm talking about models for my perturbations, models for my environments. And if this script F are all perturbations, and this is loosely, I'll define it later, I'll come to us. All perturbations not acting on Y directly. One needs to define what it is. Then the solution of this worst case risk optimization problem is the so-called causal solution, and that needs to be defined as well. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you think about E as different environments, does it make sense that all have the same beta? <coughs> I mean, I can think about in one in one environment, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, 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 the government make giving more money for public uh, uh, is is good. But in another environment, it has zero effect. I think you pointed to the right thing. So. This whole machinery does have the same beta if you condition on the right variables. If you only include the causal variables, I'll come to that, then yes, then it is the same sort of beta. But if you have different covariates, you have different shift of your covariates, you just compute the regression coefficients, it depends on how your covariates are shifted, right? And then all of a sudden, if you simply compute the, the OLS, for example, you see very different regression coefficients. So in a way, x, e also, one of them is maybe e itself or something. No, this, uh, well, uh, it's more this kind of picture. There's e, maybe it comes from a random e, it has a influence on x, it shifts my x, it scales them, it perturbs them a lot, and x has an influence on that. Of course, people then later come with much more complicated models, and I've come to that, so maybe there's a hidden confounder, and so on and so forth, I'll, I'll discuss that. But for simplicity, for simplicity at the moment, you can think of, okay, I have environments, they change my x a lot, this is kind of not acting on Y directly. They do not act directly on Y. And now, uh, of course, if I compute regression coefficients, they will be very different. Okay. So the point of this slide is, in a way, to say, indeed, causal parameters, they do 
solve a worst case uh, risk optimization problem if you look at a certain class and if this class satisfies certain conditions. So the perturbations can be <coughs> arbitrarily strong, but they're not allowed to act directly on one. Okay. Yeah? How, if you just to make E the treatment and go back to the classic potential outcomes framework, would you get the same equation? So you're asking whether, whether the, it is not directly acting on Y or not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, this is a big question. I, I will relax that assumption, but I try to make this a bit more uh, easy to step in. Later, we will actually allow that E points to Y, so I will relax it. So in my economical scenario example, I would doubt it. In the genomic example, where I actually perturb the gene, it probably does not act directly on the growth rate of the plant. So this part falls. So later we will discuss other models for script F and E and make the relations more precise in five time. Okay, so how can we try to exploit these heterogeneities from the data? And this is maybe a bit <laughs> your remark, uh, Boas. So here is a conceptual uh, assumption, and uh, you can question that as well, and we will relax it also. But conceptually, I think it's interesting to think this way. And so this is an invariant assumption. It's an, an assumption, and I'll discuss later when this assumption holds. And the assumption reads as follows. I have an invariant assumption with respect to this script E, these environments which I've observed in the data. And the assumption says there exists a subset of covariates. S star is a subset of the covariate indices, such that if you condition Y on these subsets of covariates, so this conditional distribution, then this remains invariant across all heterogeneities, across all perturbations in this script. So this is just a relaxation of the covariate shift assumption. The covariate shift yeah. assumption says... Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we have... <laughs> and, but causal people talk about the same stuff, which is kind of interesting. So this is the purpose, maybe, a bit of my talk trying to link the things together. You know much more about the transfer learning than I do, but it is very close to everything. So in a linear model setting, it just translates to, okay, the condition distribution would be there exists a regression parameter, gamma star. It's the same gamma star. We support say this star such that you can always write ye is xe same gamma star plus error term. The error term is uncorrelated from a star. And the residual term, the error term, has the same distribution for all environments. The XE, we discussed that before, they can shift a lot for different perturbations, different environments. <coughs> so from an applied point of view, and from a transfer learning point of view, we would say, OK, gamma star, S star is interesting if you have a data set. And all of a sudden, you condition on some of the variables. And then you see it's the same regression parameter. It's the same residual term. This is interesting, right? This is actually what my collaborators in experimental science do, right? They, they run experiments on different conditions. And if they see a structure which remains stable across different environments, it's an interesting structure. OK, now you can ask this condition, of course, with respect to another space, to my script F. I mean, uh, mathematically, I just ask it for the largest space. Uh, there exists a set of variables A star, such that the conditional distribution is invariant for this much larger space. Of course, we need some sort of an assumption to make this extrapolation, otherwise it's hopeless. Now, this is maybe even more interesting, this set S star, because it says something about new unseen environments. And from a robustness viewpoint, you can look at this as follows. You can say any subset S star, which fulfills this invariance assumption, is interesting as it is stabilizing the conditional distribution and it leads to something robust. And this stabilizing with invariance will be the basis of our robustifying procedure. What does that have to do with causality? So some of you might know a bit of causality, some of you not. But here, there are various definitions of causality. Here's a very simple one with structural equation models and corresponding graphs and influence diagrams. So you have a y variable. You have an underlying true causal influence diagram, and people would define the causal variables of Y are the parental variables here in the graph. And then there is a uh, quantitative model 
for this graph, and this is a structural equation model. So y would just be a function of the parental variables only, comma error term, and all the x's are functions of the parental variables, comma error terms. And an important assumption is these error terms, they're mutually independent. That excludes, for the moment, hidden confounders. I'll come to that. Okay. So my problem, what I want to look at, is under what model for the environment, under what model for the perturbations. Now we need to talk about models for the perturbations, model for the environment. Under what model do we have an interesting description of these sets of covariates which lead to invariance? And here is one interesting description, I think. So loosely speaking, I assume that these perturbations do not act directly on Y. If you think in terms of graphical models, my environments would be outcomes of this variable E, and it would mean that E doesn't point directly to Y. And also the other main assumption in causality, I guess also in transfer learning, is the perturbations do not change the relation between X and Y. Right? And hopefully, these perturbations change the distribution of X a lot, because that is informative. And so typically we write it this way. Okay. And then it's very easy to derive the following result. So we have a structural equation model for Y and X. We have a model for the perturbations. So my perturbations are script F. The assumptions on my perturbations are the ones from before. They do not act directly on Y, so this is forbidden. They do not change the mechanism between X and Y. And then the causal variables, the parental variables in this structural equation model, they do satisfy the invariance assumption. Okay. Yep. Sir, in the previous slide, when you intervene on the X, so would it, the intervention would propagate through the ground test, so all the changes sure. that, 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 so that you are allowing. Yeah, that's in a structural equation model. This is yeah. dynamic, right? It propagates through. So you intervene on X <coughs> and then through. So in the, that sense, is this, this can depend on E, the relation between Yeah, there's so dependence. So there's dependence, but no direct dependence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, the causal variables, if you condition on them, they lead to invariance under these assumptions on this model for the perturbation. Like, the do perturbations from Perl dissatisfies this model. This is a model. A do, Perl's do operation is a model for a perturbation, and it satisfies this assumption. Okay. So if you get invariance, then it's an easy step to show that the solution of this worst case risk optimization problem is the causal parameter. Because intuitively, if you have any kind of perturbation in this model, and if you condition on the causal variables, you have invariance, so that's good, that will not throw up everything, and then it's an easy step to show that this class is sufficiently large such that the worst case risk optimizer is the causal solution. Yeah? Could you restate invariance as some type of condition under which you will get strong ignorability? Can you speak up? Can you state invariance as a set of perturbations over which you will get strong ignorability? Yep. I, I, there will be other perturbation models. Um, I, I try to, so like the instrumental variable uh, regression model in economics is another perturbation model. Right, but I'm just saying the classic Rubin causal framework, right, where you have the requirement of strong ignorability, right? I'm asking how would the invariance relate back to that form? It does. I'll, I'll come with a slide. Uh, so there can be. The, are you asking whether this is the only uh, model for the perturbation? No, no, I'm just asking, how would this model fit with the notion of strong ignorability in the Rubin causal frame? <coughs> Sorry, I, I could not. Uh, can you, I, I, you? Sorry, I'm asking how this model would correspond to strong ignorability in the Rubin causal frame. So, the identifiability is another issue here. So, so the causal sets are some sets, right, which satisfy invariance, but there are other sets which satisfy invariance as well. Now, if, <coughs> if the perturbation class is sufficiently rich, and this is kind of hidden in this here too, right? If, if this is all perturbations which do not act directly on Y, then you can identify. Okay. Okay. And intuitively, it means the more heterogeneity actually I see, it's kind of obvious, right, the more I can identify. 
Okay, if the perturbations are not arbitrarily strong, for example, then the solution will be different. It's not the cause. So we discussed it a bit before, but let's look at this again. So about these assumptions. So this is my example with the growth rate of the plant and the genomics. Why is the growth rate x are very high dimensional covariates of gene expressions? And the perturbations are different gene knockout perturbations. And we ask about these assumptions. And it's plausible that the first assumption holds, right? If I knock out the gene, it probably does not directly influence the growth rate of the plant. That's plausible. I have no clue, and probably there is something happening. If I knock out the gene, maybe the mechanism between x and y changes. But you need to make some sort of first order or zero order assumption in order to do that extrapolation, otherwise it's hopeless. Obviously, if I knock out the gene, and you can observe that, the gene expression of that knocked out genes and a couple others, they change a lot. So that perturbs indeed the X, which is good. I have a problem with uh, the first assumption. I can think about knockouts that kill the plant altogether. Right? I mean, there are certain genes that are crucial for life. You knock them out, nothing works. No, no, but I mean, the assumption is that if you knock out, I knock on the gene. I knock out on the gene. Of course, it was the question somewhere, there's a dynamic propagation of that. But the gene knockout, you really, from biotechnology, you change this kind of gene. You kind of put in different uh, DNA uh, seeds and try to block it. And so that sort of biotechnological operation it's plausible that that doesn't change directly the growth rate of the plant. Maybe it does. I mean, but, but of course, uh, I'm only saying, I think this is a plausible assumption. Yeah. Peter, in some sense, the implicit there is that all other variables are kept constant <laughs> when you say that the, that the direct effect yeah. is... Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> We just argued that causality has something to do with invariance. And this is actually very long understood. Here's a picture of Trygve Havelmo. He was a Norwegian economist. He was very famous. He got the Nobel Prize. And in 1943, already he had in his paper that if you condition on the causal variables, he had kind of a structural equation model. He actually wrote down there's invariance of the system. So he had that. And so many people have worked on that. If you condition on the causal variables, you get invariance. Now, the interesting other direction is if you actually see invariance in the data, and maybe you can try to do that. You have maybe a lot of data, and you can try to infer invariance in the data, or see invariance in the data. Can you conclude on causality or on some sort of predictive stability? And the answer is yes, you can do something. And so this is kind of the pursuit of search for invariance in the data and try to conclude on causal structures or get predictive robustness. Now, for the experts in the room, there's a severe identifiability issue. This was a question a bit there. So you cannot, in general, you can only get the Markov equivalence class of the graphs. And I'm skipping many details here because I want to come more to the robustness story. But what you can do is you can come up with at least a conservative procedure which has a type 1 uh, guarantee against false positive selection. So it's kind of a formula, but with controllable probability. Under these assumptions, on the perturbation model, and you have a structural equation model, you can come up with an algorithm which with high probability would not produce a false causal selection. Maybe it doesn't find anything. You pointed that out earlier. Maybe this algorithm just spits out, I don't find any causal variable. Too bad. But when it finds something <laughs> under these conditions, with controllable probability, it must be a causal there. So here is a framework which is much more quantitative and gives kind of a clear um, understanding, maybe also how we can relax the conditions and what the corresponding robustness is. And we call this anchor regression, and there's a, co a corresponding causal regularization. And I'm doing a slight sneak switch in notation. So my environments from before, they're now outcomes of what, what I, we call an anchor. So it is an A instead of an E. And the picture is the same as here. So I have environments, I have outcomes of this anchor variable. They might influence X, and then the propagation is from X to Y. 
I'm just looking at linear systems, I'm looking at linear structural equation models, and this would be the model. So the much more celebrated model is the instrumental variable regression model. And this is very relevant. Now you say, okay, you have hidden confounding variables. That, of course, happens always in real life. And this is the model. The main assumption in this model is that people call this an instrument. The instrument does not have an effect on H, on the hidden confounders. And the instrument also, again, the same assumption from before, the instrument does not have a direct effect on Y. And well, I'm not an economist, but at least from my more maybe biology-driven applications, this seems a bit difficult. How the heck can I find an instrument which has no effect on hidden structure and I cannot even name what the hidden structure is, right? So we want to relax that assumption. We say, okay, this instrument, this anchor, is allowed to point to H. So this is our model. It can have an effect on hidden structure. I don't know what it is. It can be very multivariate. The anchor can also point to Y. I relax that assumption. It can have a direct effect on Y. So you asked about this before. This is possible. There can also be cyclic structure here. For, the simp as, uh, for simplicity, I look at linear systems. The only assumption here is the anchor is why it's called an anchor. It's a source node in the graph. And people in economics would call it an exogenous variable. So the anchor is an exogenous variable. And so here's my linear structural equation model. There's an error term and there's this, this exogenous term which comes from this anchor. So the environments, this is an exogenous term which comes into the system. Instrumental variable regression is a special case of anchor. We relax this very uh, stringent condition. But there's, of course, a price to be paid for that. And that's probably why many people have not looked at this. There's now a <coughs> fundamental identifiability problem. If your instrument, if your anchor points to H or and to Y, you cannot identify the causal effect. It's impossible. People said, well, this is an ill-post model. It is ill-post for causality. But you still get some sort of robustness properties with this model. And we think this is interesting. So this is what I just said. This, what we call causal regularization, can offer something in this model. And what you can prove, this is non-trivial, but you can still achieve a form of invariance. We call it a shift invariance. I'll define it. And what is a non-trivial fact to show is that you still get shift invariance. So residuals are so-called invariant under shift perturbations if and only if the residuals are uncorrelated with your anchor variable, with your instrument. Okay. Yep. Is it specific to the case of linear models? Yes, yeah, it's linear. Otherwise, it's uh, uncorrelated and it becomes dependent. It's harder, but conceptually it's the same. But actually doing it in practice is much harder. It's con it becomes to conditional independence testing and so on. So, but in the linear case, what we then try to do is to encourage orthogonality of the residuals with A. So you construct an estimator like you minimize residual sum of squares and you encourage a solution which is fairly orthogonal to A. So xi is a regularization parameter. For a large xi, you move it to the orthogonal solution. I'm running out of time. Huh? <laughs> so, three, four minutes. Okay. This is a bit a different way to express that estimator. It's just written down these projections on A. This is very similar, of course. So pi A is the projection on the column space of A. And so the anchor regression estimator is solving this optimization problem. You project. So this is the anti-projection of the residual length squared plus gamma, regularization term, projection on A residual length squared. For gamma equal one, you have least squares because you can always decompose the square area into anti-projection and projection squared. For general gamma, gamma, it's a regularization. It's a convex problem. It's very easy to solve. If you're in high dimensions, you can add L1 penalties, group sparsity penalties, and so on. So there's a fundamental identifiability problem. But this anchor regression uh, estimator solves for optimizing a worst case risk. So it has a robustness property. And give me a bit time to introduce that. So here is the shift perturbation. This is the class of perturbations. So the model for the heterogeneous data is this linear system. There's the exogenous term. 
and the perturbed version is replacing the heterogeneity with a shift vector. It can be deterministic, it can be random. It's this V here. So this is the shifted version, it's dynamic. And the V has a certain, well, this is a technical definition, it's in the span of M, but it has a certain length gamma, a certain size gamma. Gamma large is a large shift, gamma small is a small shift. And this is maybe an interesting theorem. You can prove that in the population version, and then for the sample version you can give bounds on that, for the population version there's a very interesting duality. So PA is now the population version of the projection, is the conditional expectation, and the theorem says for any regression parameter, you look at the worst case risk in these shift perturbation class. Okay? The shifts in this class have a certain strength, a certain size gamma, and this gamma is exactly the regularization term here. So this is the population version of my anchor regression estimator. It's anti-projection residual length squared plus gamma regularization of the projection of the residual length squared. And so this is a very interesting connection, we think, between shift perturbations, kind of causality. Causality would be all perturbations. This is on a subclass and robustness. And of course, because you have this, this holds also for the argument. And this is the justification that this anchor regression actually doesn't give you the causal solution, but it gives you a more causally geared solution, which is robust against shift perturbations. You can apply this in practice. You can look at a couple uh, uh, real data analysis, uh, and you can look at performance in terms of robustness, in terms of prediction gain. And if you apply that on larger scale data, where you expect heterogeneity, you do gain over the standard machinery with least squares. So this was a least squares example. It's about 15, 25% gain. Here's an example where you can use random forests. This is the nonlinear version. We have no theory on this, but we have an algorithm. You can stick in a random forest. You can stick in another machine learning technique. And if the data is heterogeneous, and if the future will be a bit different, that's the transfer learning aspect we will gain. And I'll come to the end. So I always have been taught that, you know, heterogeneity is some sort of bad thing, non-stationarity is not good. Here is somehow a story where you try to exploit it. It's informative and you better make it your friend rather than your enemy. Thank you. Do have time for a quick question? Yeah. So here your anchor regression is like a weighted version of ordinary least square and two stage least square. So what, what, uh, what we know is if the IV model is correct, then uh, the second one, two stage least square, will give you the correct answer. But ordinary least square will give you a very wrong answer if the confounder is wrong. But here you make a weighted version. So that means in, if the IV model is correct, then your regression will not give you yeah. So in the IV model, if it's correct, it can do two-stage least squares. If you use it on real data, as you might know, it has a huge variance, two-stage least squares. So on finite sample, actually, if you regularize uh, and do a bit regularization, you improve over the standard two-stage least squares estimator. But the point is, so this anchor regression estimator, if I choose gamma equals affinity, I get the two-stage least squares estimator in the IV model. The other point is that if the IV assumptions actually hold, if the instruments are valid and so on and so forth, with this anchor regression estimator with gamma infinity, I get the causal solution. Okay, let's thank Peter again. So we have a short break before Vitaly's talk.